Are you ready to study the Bible this morning? I'm going to place in your hands an outline so you will be able to not only follow it this morning, but take it home with you and study it carefully for yourself. Please take one per family so that we have enough for everyone today. You will notice the title of our message is entitled, What is Sin? Why do we want to talk about such a negative subject as that? We could pick so many more subjects in the Bible that aren't that negative. What is sin? Well, it's a little bit like going to a doctor's office. When you go to visit the doctor, you go because something isn't quite way, the way it should be, but you don't know what it is. The most valuable thing you can do, you can get from that doctor's office visit is a correct diagnosis. Because if the diagnosis is wrong, the remedy isn't going to work. And it's just like that in the gospel. If we don't know what's wrong with us, we won't be able to fix what's wrong. So we desperately need to know what the sin is for which we are lost and condemned. Now, I want to make sure, are there people that uh, did not get a copy of the outline? Raise your hand if you didn't get a copy. Are a few more needed? There are a few more needed. Matthew, would you be willing to get a few extra copies for us? We'll have more in just a few minutes. Not only is this subject important for diagnosing what is wrong, but believe it or not, depending on your answer to this simple little question, what is sin, two different gospels are built, two different ways of salvation, two different understandings how God saves us from sin. And folks, I don't think there are two different gospels, two different ways of salvation. So this subject is not a minor one. I'm going to suggest it's one of the most important questions you will ask and answer in all of your study of the Bible. Now, if you look at the outline that you've been given, it says, Definition A, Original Sin, subtitled, Sin as Nature. Now, what does that mean? Sin as Nature means that when Adam and Eve sinned, they turned our natures inside out so that what the nature that God had given to us, a loving, gentle, kind, obedient nature, was turned into a selfish, proud, discouraged, and you name it, nature. We now have a very bad nature. And definition A says the only thing you have to do to get yourself a sinner, born, uh, lost and condemned, going to hell, is to get yourself born and draw your first breath. That's the only thing you have to do to be a sinner. Because your nature is so bad that no matter what good things you do, you are condemned and lost. Now, the outline you're being given right now is the brief outline. We'll get a more complete outline for you in just a moment. So in definition A, sin is the way you are born and the way you are, and you can't help it. That happens to be the majority position of the Christian world about what sin is. You're born a sinner. You can't help it. It's just the way it is. Definition B, sin as choice. Definition B says everything that definition A says, that we do have a bad nature. We fight with this nature all our lives. We struggle with the nature we're born with. But it says one thing different. We are not automatically sinners lost and going to hell because we happen to inherit bad equipment. It says you have to do one more thing to be a condemned lost sinner. You must know the difference between right and wrong and deliberately choose to do what is wrong. Then you sin against God. So in definition B, sin is always a choice. And this morning, I'm going to share with you <clears throat> why I take the minority view that sin is always a choice. By the way, it's not always bad to be in the minority. When Noah stepped onto the ark, he was the smallest minority you could imagine. But when he stepped off of the ark, he was the largest majority in the whole world. <laughs> All right, you've noticed that I've said there's a difference between evil and guilt. Now, what do I mean precisely by that? What is the difference between evil and guilt? Some of you have in your home a perfect example of this in the form of a little pet that we have in our homes. All right, here are the outlines. Now, this is the outline for this morning. Raise your hand if you did not get a copy 
of the what is sin outline. We want to make sure you have that in your hand. Several over on this side, one up here in front, Matthew. Everybody, one more over here. Yeah. A couple more over here on this side. All right, everybody have one now? Good. Some of you have in your own homes a little animal that you consider a pet. But when you examine this animal, you really wonder if you made a good decision. <laughs> because this pet has a split personality. There's one side of this little pet that enjoys your company, rubs up against your legs, goes to sleep on your lap. And then you just open the door to the out of doors and watch the change in personality that comes over that little cat of yours. Because, you see, outdoors, in the world in which its ancestors came from, there are only two rules that matter. Number one, you run from anything that's bigger than you. It's called survival. Rule number two, you catch anything that's smaller than you. It's called fun. <laughs> and your cat is out there to enjoy rule number two. Have you watched and noticed that when your cat catches that little mouse or gopher, it doesn't just humanely, quickly, and mercifully put it out of its misery to end its suffering? Have you noticed that? <laughs> Instead, it plays with that little animal. It lets it escape and catches it all over again. Now, let me ask you a simple question. Can uh, mice and gophers feel pain? Can they suffer? Are they in the process of feeling a lot of pain right now, right then, and suffering? Does your cat care? Does it have any compassion? All it cares about is, am I having a good time? Is this fun? That's all it wants to know. And you watch it all. Is that good or evil, folks, that you were watching out in your backyard? Is it the way God designed things? No, it's part of an evil world, brought about by a choice Adam and Eve made. What do you do when your cat comes marching up to your back door, feathers sticking out of all sides of its mouth, waiting to be praised for the good job it has done in your backyard? It got rid of one of those nasty little songbirds that clutter up the place. What do you do? Do you hold a little trial right on your back porch? Do you get a jury together to decide guilt or innocence? Do you have a jail cell prepared in case the verdict is guilty? And of course, you don't do any of those things. Instead, you scold your cat, brush away the feathers, and you actually welcome that little killer back into your house. <laughs> what you have just done is to make a distinction between evil and guilt. You recognize that what happened was evil. But because you have decided that in that little brain of your cat there is no room for something we call conscience, you ascribe no guilt to your cat. Guilt, a result of knowledge and choice, understanding God's will. So that's what I mean by the difference between evil and guilt. Let's see what the Bible says. You have some text here. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. This is God's first command to his first created beings. And watch carefully because it didn't work out the way God said it would. Did God's promise fail? Genesis 2, 17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now did Adam and Eve eat of the fruit? Did they die that day? Wow, that was 900 years down in the future. Did God's promise fail? Turn with me to Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8. Revelation 13, verse 8. Now I'm focusing on the first half of this verse. I'm sorry, the last half of this verse. Revelation 13, 8. And I am reading it from the King James translation. Some other translations handle this differently. Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, the last part. It speaks there of the book of life of the Lamb. And then it says, the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. The Lamb, Jesus Christ, slain from the foundation of the world? Doesn't make sense either. 
because he was killed 4,000 years later. So what does this mean? Take this little outline that you've been given now. Go to the second page, which is really on the back side of the first page, where it says Spirit of Prophecy Statements. And look at the question that is asked. Why was not the death penalty at once enforced in his case? Why not? Because a ransom was found. God's only begotten Son volunteered to take the sin of men upon himself and to make an atonement for the fallen race. So something happened to change the death sentence upon the human race. Next paragraph. The instant man accepted the temptations of Satan and did the very things God had said he should not do, Christ, the Son of God, stood between the living and the dead, saying, Let the punishment fall on me. I will stand in man's place. He shall have another chance. Oh, look at that for a moment. First of all, God doesn't wait for Adam and Eve to come crawling back on hands and knees asking for help. He's there before they ask for help. Our God is a seeking God. He's not a waiting God. He's looking for us long before we look for him. And notice carefully again, Christ steps in without Adam asking for help. Because you see, there's a crisis. The human race is in danger of extinction. Because the human race is Adam and Eve. And at that moment, if God carries out what he said would happen, there would be no you and me. There would be no human race. And so there is an immediate crisis here. And Jesus steps in, and notice what he says again. Let the punishment fall on me. I will stand in man's place. He shall have another chance. Are you glad, folks, that Jesus stepped into the garden 6,000 years ago? Yes, it's important he died on the cross, but I'm glad he stepped into the garden and gave the human race a second chance. Now, could Adam and Eve still have been lost after Jesus gave them a second chance? You know the story of Cain and Abel. Abel says, if a sacrifice is needed, pointing to the Lamb of God, I'll bring a sacrifice. Cain said, this is not my problem. I don't need help. My parents got us into this mess. Let them take care of it. I'll just find some stuff in the garden and bring that. The reason Cain was lost and the reason you and I could be lost the only way we can be lost is by trampling over the cross of Jesus Christ. And yes, then we can be lost. Because you see, I believe that when Jesus stepped into the garden, he was trying to do something for the human race to give every human being a chance for eternal life. He put the cross right in our way. And he says, if you'll just look to the cross and look to what I'm doing for the race, you can have eternal life. But if you trample over the cross, there's nothing more I can do for you. You see, definition A, the common definition of sin, sin as nature, says it's easy to be lost. It's easy to go to hell. You just get yourself born and draw your first breath. You've got a bad nature. You're headed for hell on a slippery slope. But definition B says no. God is trying to make it hard to be lost. Before every baby that is born, there is a cross because that baby is drawing its first breath because of the cross of Jesus Christ. That baby has a chance for eternal life because of the cross of Jesus Christ. And the only way that baby growing up to adulthood will ever get to hell is by trampling over the cross to get there. I think God is trying to make it hard for human beings to go to hell. Let's see what Jesus says on the subject. Go back to the outline. I'm going to skip some of the texts. You can read them on your own later. This is for your study. Go with me to John chapter 9. John chapter 9, the first three verses. Very familiar story. Jesus and his disciples are walking along the road. They come across a man who had been blind from his birth. And the disciples say, what a perfect opportunity to ask a question that has been bothering us for a long time. And that question is in verse 2. Master... Who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now notice their question. They are not asking, is this man a sinner? No, no, that's obvious. Look at his eyes. Of course he's a sinner. He's being punished for something. 
and because he was born that way, it's a problem. Did his parents do something very bad and he's being punished for his parents' sin? Or notice the second half of their question. Before he was born in his mother's womb, did he do something that caused him to be punished with blindness? That's their question. And Jesus' answer is in verse 3. Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents. Jesus says your question is completely wrong. Don't assume by looking at his eyes that he's being punished for a sin of either his parents or his own before he was born. His blindness has nothing to do with punishment. And then he adds, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Right now, evil, the works of Satan were being made manifest. He was blind. That isn't the way God created us. That's a product of sin. And Jesus says, wait a moment, and you'll see the works of God. Now, how does Jesus show the works of God? Does he hold out his hand and say, I forgive your blindness? Does this blindness need forgiving? What does it need? Healing. And that's what Jesus does. You see, Jesus is simply saying, make a distinction between something that is evil. It doesn't need forgiveness. It needs restoration, recreation, healing. And then there is guilt, which needs forgiveness. Jesus is trying to make that distinction. Let's go on. John chapter 5. John chapter 5, verses 24 and 25, where Jesus seems to contradict himself in two verses right next to each other. Look what he said, verse 24. Verily, so he's saying truthfully, listen carefully, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. According to the words of Jesus, when can you have everlasting life? Now? Right now? If you believe in him? That's what Jesus said. But look at the next verse. Verily, again, listen carefully, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead, the dead, shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. How in the world can you have everlasting life and be dead at the same time? Surely Jesus contradicts himself. Or did something happen to death when Jesus stepped into the Garden of Eden to give the human race a second chance? Did he say to Adam and Eve, you will have to go back to the earth from which you were made, unto the dust, but you can live again for all eternity? Did he not make that distinction? There is a death that all die evil because of what happened in the Garden of Eden. But there is another death, eternal death, which only those who trample over the cross will experience. So I'm going to try to put up a little chart here to try to uh, summarize in an easy way what we're talking about. I'm going to hold it up first of all so you can see it and then put it down there. The sin that Adam and Eve brought into the world, the sin that they made, their, the, the decision they made has two results. It has evil and it has guilt. Evil leads to the first death, the natural result of evil in the world. But guilt leads to the second death, hell, the penalty for sin. Two different results of Adam and Eve's sin two different penalties for them. How does God handle it? Well, he forgives our guilt. If our guilt is forgiven, what else is gone out of our future? There's no hell in our future at all. There's no fear of the second death. Will we still suffer evil and die the first death? And so Jesus does not contradict himself. Even though you sleep in the grave for a little while, you have everlasting life and no one can take it from you. Two different results. For two different problems. All right, go with me to section C, guilt because of choice. We're going to go directly to John chapter 9, verse 41. John chapter 9, verse 41. Jesus is talking to some Pharisees here. Notice what he tells them. If ye were blind, here he means ignorant without knowledge. 
ye should have no sin. But now ye say, we see, we know what's going on, we're intelligent, therefore your sin remaineth. What is Jesus tying sin to in this verse? Isn't it knowledge? Light? That's the word over here. Light makes the difference between evil and guilt. Knowledge of God's will and a choice based on that light. Were the Pharisees born with the same bad nature that you and I are born with? But Jesus said, if you truly didn't know, if there was no opportunity for you to know, you would have no guilt. Yes, they would have evil, but no guilt. But when the light comes and you reject the light, guilt enters the picture. Key word, light and choice based upon that light. Turn with me now to James chapter 4, verse 17. I think this is the clearest text in the entire Bible on this subject. You decide for yourself. James 4, 17, doesn't need a preacher, doesn't need a commentary. Just read it and decide for yourself. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Does a baby know? Does a cat know? To him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Turn with me to James 1. The clearest definition of temptation I have found in Scripture. And watch carefully. Most Christians don't know the difference between temptation and sin. Check yourself very carefully right here. James 1, 14. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Now the word lust means anything out of harmony with the will of God, and there are a lot of things that that covers. And it says where he is drawn of his own fallen desires his own bad nature, and he's enticed by it. So, what is temptation in this world of sin? Temptation, to be a real temptation, has to have two parts, not just one. When you watch the evening news, are you personally interested in trying everything you see on the evening news at least once just to see what it'll feel like? You're not? Are there some things you see that you, wouldn't, you, have, you couldn't be paid a million dollars to participate in? Were you tempted by that? No temptation at all for you, but obviously it was a temptation for someone because it was on the evening news, wasn't it? So, a temptation. Satan has a million stimuli out there because we're all different. He's hoping that one or two of them will reach home to where I live, my nature, my personality, and I'll be pulled toward that stimulus drawn of our own lust and enticed. So it takes two things to be a temptation, a real temptation. The outward stimulus alone is not a temptation. It must have reach through into my nature and I am drawn toward that. I am pulled toward that. Guess what? Definition A says that's sin. Even if you don't carry it out, you, the fact that you are drawn by that stimulus, which is a bad thing, that means you are sinning. Being drawn is sinning, according to definition A. That means we're sinning an awful, awful lot, doesn't it? Every temptation is a sin. But that's not what it says. We're defining temptation in verse 14. Where is sin defined? Next verse, verse 15. Then when lust, this pull of our nature, hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. Notice the steps. Step number one, you're drawn of your own nature. You're enticed. You're really strongly pulled. Step three is conceiving. Something is being born, and what is being born is sin. Steps one and two are temptation. Steps three and four are sin. But definition A puts sin in step one. The Bible puts sin in step three and four. All right, I'm going to let you read the other text here on your own. Now take the outline you've been given, and again, turn to the Spirit of Prophecy statements with me. In the middle of the first page, halfway down, it's 
Patriarchs and Prophets, page 306. It is inevitable that children should suffer from the consequences of parental wrongdoing, but they are not punished for the parents' guilt except as they participate in their sins. Consequences, yes. Evil, yes. Guilt, no, unless they participate. The last paragraph on the page, Gospel Workers, page 162. Light, there's the word, light makes manifest and reproves the errors that were concealed in darkness, and as light comes, the life and character of men must change correspondingly to be in harmony with it. Sins that were once sins of ignorance because of the blindness of the mind can no more be indulged in without incurring guilt. What is a sin of ignorance? It's when you don't know and ignorantly do something that's wrong but there's no light, therefore there's no guilt. It is evil, yes, but until the light comes, there is no guilt. When the light comes, when you understand and make a choice to continue doing the same thing, then guilt enters the picture. Now turn to the last page, number two. And by the way, on your outlines, number two got copied twice on the front and the back, so you have two copies of that page. Go to wherever you want. Page two. Second paragraph on page two. Testimonies, volume five, page 177. The sin of evil speaking begins with the cherishing of evil thoughts. Guile includes impurity in all its forms. Now here is a sentence that we need to understand. An impure thought, tolerated, an unholy desire, cherished, and the soul is contaminated, its integrity compromised. Now let's define that very carefully. An impure thought or an unholy desire arising out of our own nature, is that good or evil? Well, it's evil, isn't it? One day we won't have those things plaguing us anymore, but not now. So is that sin to have the impure thought come into your mind and the unholy desire come into your thinking? The Christian world says it is sin, but the Bible and what we are reading here says is temptation. What is the next thing that must happen before the impure thought becomes sin? It has to be tolerated. It has to be cherished, and then your soul is contaminated. See, we dare not go by our feelings here. Sure, it feels contaminating to have these thoughts but always go by the Word of God, not by what we think and what our emotions tell us and our feelings. That's hugely dangerous. It says the impure thought tolerated contaminates the soul. So here is the point. There is nothing that you and I can do about these thoughts that come out of nowhere. And they don't come out of nowhere. They come out of our fallen nature, and Satan is pulling them out. There is nothing we can do about that as long as we are in this, norm, this uh, mortal body on this earth. But we can choose to reject that thought or cherish that thought. That's where the issue becomes important. If we hold on to that thought and make it our thought, it's no longer our nature, now it's our character. And folks, it's character that goes to heaven. Nature gets burned up on this earth. Nature is not a problem for God. He can create a new nature. But character is what he and we must cooperate in, per, in, in, uh, in developing. And character is what we cherish and what we tolerate. In the same paragraph, after the second set of three dots, halfway down the paragraph, no man can be forced to transgress. His own consent must be first gained. The soul must purpose the sinful act before passion can dominate over reason or iniquity triumph over conscience. Temptation, however strong, is never an excuse for sin. Pretty clear, I think. Consent, decision, choice. Next paragraph. Said the angel, if light, there it is again, if light comes and that light is set aside or rejected, then comes condemnation and the frown of God. But before the light comes, there is no sin, for there is no light for them to reject. And folks, I really wonder how the English language could be any clearer on this subject. Yet a whole 
generation of Christians do not believe that that is true. They believe that before the light comes, there is sin. And we live as sinners our entire life. Can't do anything about it. The next paragraph. There are thoughts and feelings suggested and aroused by Satan that annoy even the best of men. But if they are not cherished, if they are repulsed as hateful, the soul is not contaminated with guilt, and no other is defiled by their influence. And I just praise God for his mercy. He understands we're caught in a bad situation that we can do very little about. And he does not hold us accountable for just having bad equipment within us. Well, we have looked at uh, a diagnosis this morning. We have tried to understand the difference between temptation and sin, evil and guilt. Now, why is all this important? If you believe definition A, the standard definition of sin in the Christian world, that we're born sinners because of our nature, then there are consequences to that. Jesus Christ, then, has to have a 4,000-year skip in heredity. He cannot inherit a fallen nature, or he would be a sinner, too. So he has to take Adam's perfect nature, which means it's easy for him to obey. Well, it's just the opposite for me. That means that the gospel has to be justification, forgiveness alone, because I'm sinning constantly by nature, and I need constant forgiveness for constant sin. Sanctification will only work partially. We'll never have victory over all sin because we will be sinning by nature until Jesus comes. Perfection of character, close of probation, Jesus stepping out of the most holy place, forget it. It can't happen. That's gospel A built on definition A. But if definition B is the correct definition, sin as choice, then Jesus Christ can be tempted in all points like as I am. He has the same nature that I do. He is pulled by the things that you and I are pulled by. He has to make choices just like you do. The gospel is both justification, forgiveness, and sanctification, the power of God to deliver us from these sins that we have been plagued by. And can God do the ultimate and prepare a people that can stand before him and the rest of the universe without sinning, and he can step out of the heavenly sanctuary to prove that? All of that comes from definition B, sin as choice. That's why it's so important. Two different gospels built on two different definitions of sin. And I'll add one more statement that I wish I didn't have to make. Definition A is believed by many within the Seventh-day Adventist church today. And the gospel built on it is believed by many within the Seventh-day Adventist Church. You're going to have to make a decision about this on your own with the Word of God and the Holy Spirit to guide you. Don't depend on listening to someone else. It is not safe any longer. Well, that's our visit to the doctor's office. And I have good news and I have bad news for you this morning. The good news is we are not automatically lost, condemned, and going to hell because Adam and Eve made a tragic decision 6,000 years ago. I consider that good news. Amen. The bad news Never again can you charge that outburst of temper on an Irish heritage. <laughs> Never again can you say, the devil made me do it. I'm only human. What do you expect? All oh, those neat little excuses, they're gone. I made a choice. I must take responsibility for my choices. Now this afternoon, we aren't going to be talking anymore about sin. We're going to be talking about victory Amen. over sin. We're going to be talking about Jesus Christ. But folks, just like we've been talking this morning, most Christians who come to worship Christ Sunday by Sunday and maybe even Sabbath by Sabbath worship a Christ who never existed, a paper Christ invented by theologians to protect this doctrine of original sin. This afternoon, we're going to try to see who the real Christ was and what, that, what difference that can make in my life as I go about daily decision-making. So I hope you can join us for that. Our closing hymn this morning is Amazing Grace, a very fitting closing hymn to what we're talking about today, number 108. <laughs> 